my expectation. Because I did not expect that my all co-workers will also present me and because they say we are busy in some other talk and then we'll come and go in for the third talk. So I am grateful to uh, my very close dear Bhavi Shreya. I still remember our Chandrasekhar and myself in 1974 getting all kind of a good stuff in Gavali and then the work groups with you. So most welcome you to uh, come here to support my mentor, my teacher, my close friend, philosopher, Professor R.P. Gupta. His uh, blessings are always with me for more than now, I think it's more than three, three and a half years. My dear students, those, those who have become the prof teacher of the teachers, professor, their produce professor, Bharatwal Sham Sundar, Jaya and Gaurav and Sandeep, they are in the way to come here. And my young dear buddy, uh, a dynamic ophthalmologist, Ankita, to whom I have never seen except in the conferences. But I found that she is wonderful and future lies with this generation. So thank you very much holding uh, my hand in this uh, uh, interesting uh, instruction course. In, uh, very, uh, this topic uh, we have studied and I confess that despite working hard for 24 years, I have to learn the ABC of stem cells and uh, tissue culture. First stem cell study on electron microscopy I did it in 2000 and looking for the markers obviously was not possible to do that time. Now we are trying, but all hypothetical. And cultivate, cultivating the stem cells again it's very not difficult but tiring and you need a support of a good excellent molecular biology and pathologist who is trained in ocular pathology which is next to impossible to get in a routine general center. It, it can only be, these are the under sharing the topic. For the future though, people will talk about it, future lies with these things which you can create uh, with biomedical engineering as a customized, uh, order-placed uh, tissues. But it's very small tissue. It gives wonders in the different surgical procedures. We talk about slip print and all those. If you go with the history, these all procedures and content I was holding, amniotic, membrane transplant, all have been carried out in the 1930s, 35. Including the so-called stem cells. We didn't know it is a stem cell but the tissue was used there. So it doesn't mean that the oxygen was uh, invented uh, or discovered in 1700 or so, but before that the people were not breathing. So we do all research and reinvent it. So what I am talking is primarily has been done and I have already highlighted uh, the different uh, speakers that Historical apart, I have already said, over the past several years, the evolution of ocular surface stem cell transplantation has resulted in the development of several surgical techniques. As I have mentioned on this, and uh, you have uh, different, different, and now gone in a bunch details, and the future lies with the probably you have the, you are growing only the, once you are able to grow uh, endothelium and dispatch membrane isolated, stand about probably that will be the uh, epitome of, of these procedures. The, what exactly the stem cells? Are we really dealing with the stem cells? Or because the true stem cells are available only in the present time the bone marrow. The rest only is a hypothetical. Every tissue, every cell in the body has to generate, grow, propagate and degenerate. So in, by all means, right from brain to uh, skin everywhere you have the stem cells. Nothing uh, like that that you have typically and still we don't know exactly whether it is coming from the adjacent to the complex cell on the in the lower fornix. There is a one theory that the stem cells are from the lower fornix. Others say that these are coming the liberal stem cells are not the conductive liberal tissue but it is from the basement membrane of the cornea. There are the liberal. So still despite so much advancement in the histopathology, electron microscopy, a long term studies and a 
he is at least a complete uh, devoted his uh, work for 5 to 10 years on this subject. I, then only one can think that how it is going for this. The first noted in it, look at that, it was in the 1886 when this was reported about the corneal steps. So it is now more than uh, 200, uh, 200 years plus it's going to be. Describe in detail by 1921, more now that uh, inferior and superior and melanin pigments are also. So these all are the theories. From where it has come, still we don't know exactly. This was reported by the Bellamy and Kelly's successful reconstruction of popular surfacing surface disorders using suspension cultural techniques. They are the different techniques of the developing stem cells. And my subsequent uh, speakers will be talking in these things in detail. I am just passing that, just to introduce the subject, I have added this. I said what we are going to have in, which I say something like a uh, curtain riser. Second comes the cultivated allogenic lymphalipithelial transplantation. This is coming and the stem cells are developed from the mucosal membrane also. That is, that is also part. So you have a, a vast variety of the tissue culture. This is not only the corneal, it is liver tissue, other tissues are there. How it is being there, what is on the, making it on the, take the amniotic membrane as a platform. Second is a direct uh, cultivation. Now, I, according to the sequence, uh, Dr. Akita is here. She is here. Yes. Your presentation. Very good morning to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank Parihar sir for giving me this opportunity to be here on this esteemed platform in front of the stalwarts of ophthalmology and armed forces of course. Thank you sir. Now, before we delve into the uh, limbal cells in details and their applications in ophthalmology, let's have a broad overview of the anatomy and applied embryology. So, what are stem cells? They are undifferentiated proliferating cells which are present in all the self-replicating tissues of the body consisting of 0.5 to 10% of the total cell population. That means they are not very much but they are the very important cells in the body. The salient property of the stem cells are they are very long lived. They have a long yet asymmetrical cell cycle. They have an increased potential for error free proliferation with poor differentiation. Limbal stem cells, they are present in the palisade of wood at the limbus, which marks the boundary of the cornea, conjunctiva, and sclera. They are poorly differentiated cells, they have a primitive cytoplasm, and they have a very long cell cycle duration. The main function is to maintain the normal corneal healthy epithelium. Also, they act as the barrier which prevents the conjunctivalization of the cornea. History goes back to 1971 when, first of all, uh, Dr. Devenger and Evanson, they described that the limbus of the cornea is the anatomical landmark where the corneal pro uh, epithelial proliferation and migration occurs. Thereafter, in 1983, Shawfield proposed the niche hypothesis which became very popular and later on in 1986, Schaubert described about the biological markers to be precise RK3 which is 64,000 uh, molecular weight corneal keratin which is absent in the limbus. Limbus is a transition of the stratified non-keratinized corpus epithelium of the cornea to stratified non-keratinized columnar epithelium which is a mucin secreting goblet cells. This complex architecture of the limbus is known as palisade of wood arrangement. The corneal epithelium, the entire replication and the proliferation takes place in over the period of 7 days and these are the results of the multipotent stem cells. The hypothesis says they flourish in the limbus because of the vascularity which provides the cytokines, the growth factors which help in the function of the limbus, limbal stem cells. Due to the asymmetrical division of the uh, limbal stem cells, certain cells form cell or stem cells which harbor in the niche of the basal epithelium, the other, they uh, transform into the transient amplifying cells which further differentiate into postmitotic cells and then finally differentiate into terminally differentiated cells. This entire uh, process takes 7 to 10 days. 
This is a diagrammatic depiction of the stem cell niche where we can see uh, the color coding of the stem cells and the subsequent differentiation of the cells. Now the popular hypothesis which uh, XYZ which was given by Thought and Friend, it partially explains the corneal level. As the basal corneal epithelial cells, they are incapable of continuous replication and they eventually enter the senescence after several cell divisions. As per Thought and Friend, it is X plus Y is equal to Z, where X is the entire migration from cells of the basal epithelium, Y is the centripetal migration from the limbus, and Z is the shedding of the squamous epithelium. So basically to maintain the normal integrity of the corneal epithelium cells, the loss of the cell should be balanced by the uh, subsequent differentiation and migration. So as for the uh, asymmetrical cell divisions, the cells which go into the limbus, they form a protective barrier and when their number is depleted below a critical threshold, a condition arises which is known as limbal stem cell deficiency. A limbal stem cell deficiency, it is a clinical entity where the source for the newly generated corneal epithelial cells, they get damaged because of any conditions and subsequently the conjunctival epithelium starts encroaching the cornea and it results in an irregular unstable epithelium which further uh, allows the neovascularization and inflama inflammatory cells to migrate over the corneal epithelium. So based on the etiology it can be classified into the primary or the secondary. The primary is when the microenvironment of the stoma is not conducive and the limbal stomal niche is affected. It can further be classified into the congenital and acquired. Secondary is the when the insert occurs to the limbal stem cells directly due to the trauma, chemical injury or other autoimmune and inflammatory conditions like Steven Johnson or ocular cicatricial pemphigoid. These are the clinical photographs of the primary and secondary limbal stem cell deficiency. Now according to the extent of the involvement, LSTDs it can be either sectoral or partial or diffuse or total. So these are the clinical photographs of the same. So uh, the triad of limbal stem cell deficiency is the conjunctivalization, neovascularization and thereafter chronic inflammation. And the patient might present with dryness, foreign body sensation, tearing, blepharospasm, photophobia, decreased vision, recurrent episodes of the pain due to the uh, persistent epithelial breakdown and history of chronic inflammation with redness. On evaluation, there is a peculiar conjunctival phenotype which is seen on the cornea, which is the hallmark of the diagnosis. The corneal epithelium is dull and irregular reflex is seen with irregular thickness and transparency is gone. There is a palace formation. It may lead to chronic uh, keratitis, scarring and calcification. The fluorescent staining shows a stippled appearance because the fluorescent, it uh, gradually goes into the paracellular space of the conjunctiva and it forms the stippled appearance. There is a persistent epithelial defect and eventually melting and perforation of cornea can also be seen in certain cases. For, the, uh, for deciding any management protocol, the baseline evaluation is important which includes the best corrected visual acuity and the lit examination should be done to rule out conditions like trichiasis, dystrichiasis, entropion, ectropion and ptosis and these conditions should be corrected before planning any intervention for limbal stem cells deficiency. Tear film examination is again very important. Slit lamp evaluation should be done to rule out any hyperemia, keratinization of the conjunctiva. If the eye is inflamed, the So the definitive diagnosis is done by the conjunctival impression cytology on which we can see the goblet cells which is the hallmark of the conjunctival epithelium by LCN blue and past stains. And on immunohistochemistry we can see the absence of the corneal differentiation markers which are CK3 and CK12 and the presence of conjunctival phenotype which is CK19. Thank you sir. And over to the next speakers.
that I, you could get when you have gone through this talk. No financial disclosures and stem cells, as we all know, those which are undifferentiated or partially differentiated cells which can uh, differentiate to various types. And they have the capacity to potentially transform to specialized cells. If we talk about embryonic, embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells, embryonic can either be multipotent, which can have uh, more cell lines, but not as uh, vast as the pluripotent ones. But the totipotent stem cells are ones which have extra embryonic cells also. Adult stem cells can either be unipotent or multipotent. So what are stem cell markers? These markers are either genes or the proteins that can be used not only to isolate but also identify the stem cells. They are gold standard for identification and therapeutic purposes and functional assays can be used in these cases. The various types of markers, as uh, I have also mentioned, can involve any part. So the long list is there right from the embryonic markers to mesenchymal and neural cell markers. Coming to the liberal substance, they are defined, like, defined as undifferentiated. These are undifferentiated cells, they have a regeneration capacity and can transform to different cell types. As the previous uh, speaker had said, they have a slow proliferating potential and initially then they can go into high proliferation when they have the transient amplifying cells and then when they reach the post-biotic cells where differentiation has occurred and further uh, uh, mitotic activity does not take place. Markers, the key markers, biomarkers are, I am just giving the basic ones, are the P63, which is very vital, the ABC G2 and B5, K9 and Wibbenton, the notch one and the enhanced binding proteins. I will go into detail about each. The P63 is one of the most important ones, which are the biomarkers. They play a key role, not only in development, differentiation, but also the connection between the epithelial cells. They are accepted as a markers for the epithelial stem cells. There are various isoforms, NP63, alpha, NP63, beta and gamma are very important, not only for proliferation of the liberal stem cells, they are also useful for further differentiation also. And they play a big part in conjunction with the notch one signaling and the enhanced binding protein pathways. ABCG2, initially known as the breast cancer resistance protein 1, and was known as a universal stem marker first, is actually an ATP binding cancer subfamily G member 2. It, it is there in the limbal basal epithelium and what has been found is whenever cultured colonies are there, when ABC uh, G2 is there, these cells have a faster uh, colony formation. B5 is another important one, say ATP binding cancer subfamily B uh, was a, mainly a melanoma skin marker but it is now very important for the corneal epithelium development as well as repair and it is used as a marker as well as it is uh, in conjunction with the various uh, what I told you, the enhanced binding proteins as well as the uh, alpha, NP63 alpha it is a very uh, important prognostic factor for cell differentiation and proliferation these are, we all know about biomentin and keratin. They are two proteins are vital to formation and adhesion of the cytoskeleton. And they are seen in the, expressed together in the limbal epithelial cell. Correct cell, known to be another important part of the limbal epithelial cells. 43 and 50. 43 is usually not expressed from the limbus basal epithelium. And 50 is expressed from the basal cell epithelium. Notch one, a lot of interest has taken place in this biomarker. It is an important role in epithelial differentiation, recovery after wound healing. This inhibition of the signaling increases the proliferation of LSE, but preserves undifferentiated phenotype, or as what Jen Fayyad had said, preserves the stemness of the LSE. This is the enhanced binding protein delta. It's very important to reduce the myotic, uh, myotic sorry, presence. Works with the delta 63, NP63, alpha, beta, and gamma. And what is important is after coronary injury, when there is inactivation of this, then MP3 alpha is released and then there is constant migration and differentiation which takes place with the expression of these proteins. So to summarize, these are the main ones and now recently the BMI one is also important, useful for the self renewal of various types of diet.
Gardner Stimson. We have cytokinetic and zinkinetic to the metabolic enzyme markers. So if you see this figure, right from quiescent LSEs to active LSEs, or any transient amplifying cells and transient amplifying mature cells, these are the various factors and the proteins and genes that take place. What I told you all this, I have just summarized in one slide. So each part, these are the ones that are vital for the uh, proliferation, maintenance, and for the differentiation of the liminal stem cells. And these are negative markers for the liminal epithelial stem cells. Coming to the clinical applications of liminal stem cell markers, we all know that molecular markers are going, research is going on, it's one of the fast growing fields by you know, cytochemistry as well as by fluorescent labeling techniques. So what are they used for? One is to diagnose the liminal cell deficiencies when needed, monitoring the disease progression and treatment response. When you come to markers like P63 or ABC G2 are very important. These can help tell us whether these graphs will work well or not. Predicting clinical outcomes, especially in P63 alpha, they form more than 3% in the cultured stem cells, due to almost more than 70% response rate. Well, less than uh, that may come down to even 20 to 25 percent response. Targeted therapies, especially we have what is the WNT signaling pathways as well as the JAN and launch pathways, which are not gone into detail as a highly complex. These ones can help to promote differentiation and when needed, inhibition of these pathways can help to uh, introduce biosense and cell removal of the liminal stem cells. Quality control is another important aspect and identifying more markers. And novel markers, where the single mRNA sequencing techniques, new equations are being found out at the PEP, and the therapeutic targeting, where only epithelial cells can also be reprogrammed to differentiate into a single epithelial cell type phenotype. So this is going to help in management of bilateral LSE cases. Integrating these markers with clinical outcomes may help us to more precise approach and of course, now biomedical engineering and tissue engineering should be covered in the other uh, coming lectures, so I am not going to detail these. These are some of the articles that we have used to search. And in the end, I would just say the developments in this field hold promise for the future. I am sure we will be able to have better treatment of liver skin cell deficiency in the years to Thank you.
that is the stem cells are there and they are taking over. So that is the role of masters basically. Thank you very much, Dr. Shyam, for this excellent presentation and to deal with the, one of the most difficult uh, topic in this uh, instruction course. I request Gaurav uh, Kapoor. In fact, Gaurav uh, uh, Kapoor uh, and the next is Adhikta, they all, I had a privilege to be their teacher, but now I have a privilege to be their students. And uh, the younger generation to become teacher. When you are 60 year old, then you become a kid. So I have become kid and they have become my parents now. And he is a wonderful person and extensive knowledge and experience in the handling with the educational segment of life. So please go ahead with your talk. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, I think I still can always remain the student, uh, not a teacher. Uh, I will be speaking on the current status of tissue culture of limbal stem cells and corneal epithelium. Now over the past few years, what our speakers have generally covered the evolution of popular stem cell transplantation has resulted in the development of a several surgical techniques uh, described by various names that are presently used. Now they are all based on uh, stem cell transplantation which can be from the donor and what I will be talking of tissue culture of the same stem cells either from the same source from the person or from a different source so it is uh, or derived from various other sources which are not from the eye itself so that is the basic that is the future that is what the future holds for us so what we have right now is ex vivo expanded limbal autograph or living related ex vivo expanded limbal autograph Pellegrini and colleagues first reported the successful reconstruction of the ocular surface the next advancement in this technique was the use of human amniotic membrane as a substrate for the in vivo, uh, sorry, in vitro epithelial cell culture. Currently, most investigators they prefer the explant culture technique. The benefits of using explants are that they are easy to prepare and there is no danger of damaging the corneal epithelium through enzyme treatment. Now, you have something known as CALEP, cultivated allergenic limbal epithelial transplantation. It provides an option for patients in whom bilateral damage has taken place. So cultivated cells from a living related donor or from a deceased non-related donor may be grafted onto the recipient cornea. But the major disadvantage is the risk of rejection and you require prolonged immunosuppression. So obviously it has its own side effects and there is always the possibility of late failure when you stop the immunosuppression. So this technique has its own pitfalls. Now you have uh, what is coming to vogue now and what has been approved in the uh, in Europe also is COMET, Cultivated Oral Mucosal Epithelial Transplantation. This was started in 2002 and the indications are congenital aniridia, PEDs, thermal chemical injuries, Stephen Johnson, it covers a broad spectrum of diseases, almost 70 to 80 percent of the diseases that we tackle. The advantages are the simple surgical approach, autologous transplantation and you don't require non-aggressive post-op treatment because the risk of rejection and immunosuppression is lesser as compared to the uh, other techniques. So the preparation of the oral mucosal epithelial cells, they are 3 to 5 mm are collected under local anesthesia from the inferior buccal mucosa and decontaminated with powdered ID and then the tissue specimen is treated with dispase 2 for 1 hour after which it is uh, treated further uh, for 10 minutes to obtain a single cell suspension. Then these are seeded onto denuded amniotic membrane on nitrocellulose paper and cultured for seven days. This is what is used for the transplantation later. Now CLAP cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation, autologous cultivated limbal epithelial cell was approved by the European Medicine Agency in February 15 for the treatment of corneal burns. However, the prerequisite is the presence of a small area of preserved limbus. You need at least 2 to 3 mm of preserved limbus to go ahead with this technique which is then biopsied, expanded in culture and transplanted on the LSED affected eye. So this is again a form of culture, but basic requirement that different from format is that you require some amount of residual limbal epithelial cells, at least 2 to 3 mm. Ex vivo expansion is a complex, time consuming, expensive procedure, but it shows several advantages. Fewer risk for the donor eye, the possibility to treat bilateral LSED if you have some amount of epithelial cells remaining and the possibility to regraft following eventual payment. Now what are the challenges in transplantation? What we said, ex vivo growth of epithelial cells, allograft rejection is the primary cause of failure. 
Adequate immunosuppression is always required to achieve good outcomes. However, many surgeons fail to adequately immunosuppress because we always have that fear of the side effects of immunosuppression. So we are actually scared of going at it because uh, we are not using it regularly and we are not exposed to the various immunosuppressors which are available in the market. So unless you are doing this day in day out, you actually don't know what is going to happen 3 years, 4 years down the line with continuous immunosuppression. Identification of stem cells bone, both in vitro and in vivo has no positive markers, however some markers uh, Sir has mentioned. So these are now being used to identify the potential stem cells which can be used for ex vivo culture and then transplant. Currently limbal stem cells can only be identified by indirect methods and it is crucial to know where these stem cells are located. So you can identify how and where to perform the biopsy so that you can take the stem cell, expand it on a culture and use it for so the current future uh, basically is from uh, focusing on three primary objectives, uh, introduction of safer culture procedures, preservation of stem cells through development of novel scaffolds uh, rather than the traditional scaffolds and exploration of alternate autologous stem cell sources apart from the eye. So these are the three primary focuses of current research. Transition to xenobiotic free culture. Currently, it is based on the use of allergenic products such as murine feeder cells, feeder cows, the list is long. These potentially carry a risk of transmitting diseases, tumorogenesis or immunologic reaction. So recent works have uh, potential uh, substances like dermal fibroblasts. They have shown some potential autologous human serum has also been suggested. And human serum was also used as a single growth supplement in culture media. So this is the way forward. Coming to the second part, novel biofunctional scaffolds. Now a wide range of alternative biological, biosynthetic and synthetic scaffolds are available. So these can be fibrin gels which are prepared from commercially available two component systems which have been now successfully used for cultivation of LSCs. Other biopolymers that mimic the extracellular matrix include keratin film which can be produced of surprisingly hair or wool, silk fibroin films produced from cocoon of the silk worm, cheetos and hydrogels. So you can see the list is wide and there are research going on in a number of areas. Uh, it is clearly desirable to use autologous material for stem, uh, cell therapy. Non-limbal stem cells from the other areas of the body may be used. Uh, like I said was the third part of research. So the various options are conjunctival epithelium, oral mucosal epithelium, epidermis and hair follicle. And in particular, oral mucosa, like we discussed, OMET, it has attracted much attention as a autologous epithelial stem cells and is being used successfully in the present day. Non epithelial sources can also include bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells, adipose tissue, dental pulp stem cells, umbilical cord stem cells, and embryonic stem cells. So these transubstantiate into lineages with Epithe uh, corneal epithelium like characteristics so these can be used for ex vivo culture also and we have had promising results in vitro and in animal studies for corneal repair. So to conclude cultured limbal stem cell transplantation has several potential future improvements uh, where you can select alternate carriers, you can have gene therapy to promote this, use of an alternative source of stem cells and these improvements might further expand the clinical use of stem cells in the future. So its uh, ultimate uh, aim of uh, uh, culture ex vivo includes preparation of an ex vivo cornea composed by stem cells seeded with other cells such as fibroblasts and endothelium on a 3D scaffold where you can transplant the entire cornea onto a recipient. And treating severe dry air by tissue engineering of the lacrimal gland or the conjunctival tissue enriched with Goblet cells. These are the two ultimate aims where we can address both the components of the stem cell deficiency, the dry eye also, and the lack of the any amount of stem cells in the eye. So, if you have an engineered cornea which you can transplant en masse, that is the ultimate aim of uh, culture of the stem cell which is currently in progress and the research which is on. Thank you.
also spot errors. Right now, the present state, it is very, very difficult to be applied in a mass, uh, as a mass scale. We have to accept this state. But I am very sure uh, once you start working on it, the subsequent, maybe after 10 years, we will be able to have, like, uh, you have a customized uh, content type of tissue available, cornea will be available, which is with the tissue engineering which has come. And what the future may be there in this, uh, I think uh, this uh, umbilical cord. After all, everything comes from the umbilical cord. So, fetal embryology related research will be the uh, main uh, issue for to handle with the various types of a genetic disorder, not only for the cornea, but the, then even for the retina also. So, that I am foreseeing that research will zero down subsequently on the umbilical cord and the bone marrow. These are two. Rejection as said, we are not competent enough to handle with the rejection uh, of corneal crafting at cases also in certain cases you need a help of a human organism. So I, uh, today is a, except one or we are in the coalition uh, era, then we know that we have a limited knowledge in our own selective field. Probably I may have a knowledge of less than 1% or so. And 0.001% and Bureau of Technology. Let it be very obvious. So how can I handle uh, this uh, immunological reaction? You have to engage uh, immunologists in this type of cases, like not only these VKC cases you can do there. Corneal transplant routine cases, when you want to give this immunosuppressive, because these are systemic drugs and having multiple systemic engagement also. So many complications, contraindications, everything will come on the road. And uh, uh, other than that, uh, again I would say the hematology source is also there when you are handling these cases uh, uh, pre-operative as well as post-operative. So we, when we were dealing with these cases in our forces set up, it was the tumor board members to whom we have engaged. It is very, very important. Not that, that we are just popping up our responsibility. Ultimate, our aim is to produce the best results and the patient safety. Patient safety you have to accept. So a group of uh, multiple specialties beyond the ophthalmic forum has to be engaged in this for the final results. Thank you. With this note now, may I invite uh, uh, Kapan Jaya Koshik to talk on the tissue engineering of a cornea present status and future. There will be some overlapping because it is a interlinking topic, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, yes, all. I will be speaking on a topic issue engineering of cornea present status and future. What does bioengineering mean? It's a synonym of a genetic engineering or tissue reconstruction. How we can, can prepare a tissue which mimics corneal quality. The cornea is the outermost shield of the uh, eye, coat of eye, which protects, which transmits, which has the, uh, is the maximum light uh, refractive surface and also it has an optical property. So we are, are now, in, we are making some tissue by genetic engineering which has all these properties. So how it can be prepared? The healthy cornea is made up of collagen and water. So, so any tissue which we want to prepare, having all these uh, important qualities of uh, optical active cornea, so the main component or the biomaterial should be having collagen and water. So collagen should be uh, ideal for making uh, the corneal layers. So causes of blindness of India are as follows. Most prop uh, important causes of corneal blindness in India are infection, nutritional disorders, genetic trauma and hydrogenic. The requisite properties for reconstructive a genetically engineered cornea is based on the concept that is layer by layer. So uh, we need a suitable biomaterial which has adequate biomechanical properties, biocompatibility, degradability and transparency to have an optimal uh, optic function. So the, this approach can be divided into two types using direct cell or growth factor approach and using scaffold based cell delivery which is hydrogel or non-hydrogel based. These cell 
restore vision it is expected that they migrate proliferate and integrate into the host tissue and restore its structure and function uh, how these epithelium and endothelial cell regeneration uh, while having regeneration process they are how they are delivered so there are invasive and non invasive method uh, but for stromal regeneration the three dimensional cell delivery methods are opted for so what are the scaffold free cells or growth factor delivery these in eliminate the need of additional biomaterial the cell uh, epithelial cells and endothelial cell delivery these are uh, usually transferred into the uh, in and a thin uh, sheets micro sheets these sheets are thin and difficult to be handled and they can only produce epithelial and endothelial the growth factor delivery in form of uh, platelet rich uh, prp uh, plasma factors amniotic membrane umbilical cord serums and conditioned mediums these have properties to promote tissue healing they are easily available and no risk of rejection and highly bio bio compatible so uh, these cells are used mainly to have to treat epithelial regeneration which have already been covered by my previous speakers and not suitable for the severe coronary disease involving uh, the endothelium or the stromal uh, issues the rock inhibitors and reposodal rock inhibitor have been studied and they are known to have positive proliferating effects on the endothelial cell regeneration in studies it has been found that they leads to corneal thinning in uh, the edematous cornea so what are the scaffold based tissue engineering approaches these can be natural or synthetic synthetic have more acceptable stronger mechanical strength low degradation rate and the geometry is almost like uh, the stroma that is Uh, the special geometry and they they but they lack cell binding properties and there are inflammatory responses leading to graft rejection in synthetic materials but in natural scaffold they are more bind compatible more uh, stronger cell binding sites but of course they have poor mechanical properties so these are either protein based that is human and animal sources from where we can have collagen amniotic membrane and fibrin polysaccharide bases like algas and microbial sources and decellularized tissue of the corneal uh, layers so uh, what a good scaffold will have characteristics it should have a tensile strength like cornea proper surface topology then biodegradability water content like a cornea and cytocompatibility the synthetic hydrogen uh, based scaffolds are uh, Gaurav uh, sir has already discussed. These are polyethylene glycol-based uh, hydrogels. It has lot of water content, and it it can be used for corneal endothelial cell regenerations. Uh, the another are silicon hydrogel-based contact lens uh, lenses, which can be used for treating severe lingual stem cell uh, deficiency. Polyvinyl alcohol hydrogel. These are these are used uh, in in uh, basically cases of keratoconus uh, keratoconus and these can be placed after uh, making a uh, flap by lasik and these can be placed uh, below the lasik flaps so uh, for corneal epithelial regeneration the previous speaker has already covered amniotic membrane and uh, human anterior cells uh, lens capsule can also be tried gelatin nanofibers keratin films these can be tried for stromal regeneration we have decellularized cornea uh, which can be produced from these smile like tissues or decellularized and decalcified fresh scales can also be used as a stromal uh, cell regeneration natural non hydrogel uh, for endothelial regeneration we uh, there are uh, amniotic membrane cell which can be grown uh, on which the human cells endothelial cells can be grown then decellularized human corneal stroma freeze dried hyaluronic acid gelatin sheets can also be used for endothelial regeneration now the future lies in liquid cornea the, the, the these have been tried in vitro in the lab animal trials have also been done but human clinical trials are awaited these have property of hydrogel 
Initially, they are liquid in uh, temperature, but within the biological in vivo temperature, they form a gel and fill up the uh, wound which is there. So, it, these are the component like the gelatin, chitosin, and uh, these can be used for uh, such problems. Uh, there are prefabricated collagen based hydrogels which have been also tried. Uh, these are collagen and HPLC composite. These can be used to treat keratoconus. Uh, uh, scaffold and these are implanted by uh, ALKs. Uh, then the, there are another collagen shape molded collagen, compressed collagen hydrogels. These all have been under research and the future lies in bio rating that is future of coral bioengineering. Uh, this is a new developing method for mimicking proper microenvironment for encapsulated cell for specially stromal regeneration. In this technique, the required geometry, that special one is converted into the material via computer. There are three types, inkjet, extrusion based 3D printers and laser resistant 3D printers. So future lies in bio printing. To conclude my talk, uh, uh, bioengineered cornea, this is an important goal for all regenerative medicine that it approaches in the elimination of the donor tissue. So, but for successful techniques, especially holds uh, great potential where at least minimum number of limbal stem cells are still available in at least one of the disease types. It is useful for treatment of bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency. It mimics native cornea as it is devoid of synthetic biomaterials and therefore the risk of long term immunosuppression is minimal. Another promising thing is the gene therapy. Cornea is especially of particular interest for targeted gene therapy because of the avascularity, immune privilege status and ease of clinician access. In addition,